When I saw the announcement for the 13-inch MacBook Pro, like most people, I was kind of disappointed that the new 10th generation CPUs were only available on the more expensive model with four Thunderbolt 3 ports, but I was still excited to check it out anyway just to appreciate the laptop itself and to play around with it. But unfortunately, as I was going through my series of tests, I found that the higher end model really wasn't any better than the base model and there weren't any major improvements compared to the previous model aside from the obvious keyboard like we got with the 16 inch. So the 16 inch got a bigger screen, it got much better thermals, a new keyboard, bigger battery, a redesigned speaker with a second subwoofer, the RAM and SSD upgrades were also comically overkill, it's just like a bragging right, and it doubled the base memory and storage at the same price. So let's just go through this laptop, we'll talk about what's new, and everyone can make their own decision for whether or not to pick the one with two or four Thunderbolt 3 ports, or whether to wait for the next refresh altogether. So in my previous 13-inch MacBook Pro reviews, there was one thing that I didn't go in-depth about, and that was the hinge. It's a one-hand open, but some people take this literally and assume that it just means the hinge is loose, but whenever I say that a hinge is a one-hand open, it means that if I close it halfway and I tap on it, it won't fall shut from gravity. So it's stiff enough to maintain its position, but loose enough to open with one hand without the base of the laptop moving. The other thing that I didn't talk about is screen wobble, because I never really noticed it until I started testing for it a couple of months ago, and without any context, it kind of looks pretty bad here, but I would say it's like an eight out of 10. MacBooks don't have touchscreens, so it's not really an issue, or at least not as big of an issue as if you had a touchscreen laptop. It's just for the sake of being thorough in case it happens to be relevant to someone watching. The rest of the build is excellent. CNC milled aluminum, it's got an anodized finish. There's a little bit of flex on the screen and on the keyboard deck, but it's very minimal, and I wouldn't really complain about it, especially given how thin the screen is. The keyboard is going to be the biggest reason for upgrading for a lot of people, primarily because of the reliability issues with the butterfly keyboard. In terms of comfort, I find it to be closer to the butterfly keyboard than the old 2015 MacBook Pro keyboards. The key travel is still relatively shallow, especially compared to something like the Surface laptop. The layout is good, it's tactile, and in terms of typing speed and accuracy, I'm usually around 110 words per minute, like with most other laptops, so no issues there. Generally speaking though, if a keyboard has shallow key travel and lacks any tactile feedback, that's usually where my speed and accuracy takes a big hit. So the vast majority of laptops are fine, but most are just not very comfortable to type on for long sessions. The only thing that's keeping this from being an all-around great keyboard is the shallow key travel because everything else is actually quite good. And I also haven't seen any articles talking about keyboard issues with the 16-inch MacBook Pro, so it looks pretty good so far. Over the past few months, I've started to look into what makes a good trackpad. Because in the past, I've always just said that MacBook trackpads were the best because they're accurate, they have a smooth surface, gestures were great, and all this basic surface level stuff. So I want to talk about specific concrete things that MacBook trackpads excel at compared to the best Windows trackpads. Um, first of all, it does a much better job at tracking accuracy with very small movements. The force required to activate a click can be adjusted to help reduce the strain on your finger after clicking like thousands of times throughout the day. The gestures in macOS are instant and responsive, whereas Windows gestures have this slight delay. Um, it's not very big, but it is noticeable. And one thing that I recently realized is clicky trackpads are generally quite loud, and quiet trackpads generally have this soft, dampened feel to the click. But the trackpad on MacBooks are clicky and quiet at the same time. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I was too lazy to ask one of my friends to borrow the previous model to compare the speakers against. At this point, given the size that they have to work with, like, this is really good. They're more than loud enough, and I rarely go above 75 to 80% volume. Uh, bass response is also quite good. In fact, I actually find that it's a little bit heavy on the upper bass, and if you really look for it, you will notice a little bit of distortion in the upper bass where it's boosted, as well as in the lower treble, but where these excel at is dynamic range and vocal performance. Like if you wanna watch a movie in bed on your laptop, I think most people will really like these speakers. It's just very convenient. And I also wanna give a shout out to the Surface Laptop 3 in a very close second place. Really nice to see laptop speakers start to improve on the Windows side. 
When the 16-inch MacBook Pro was released, there were rumors of a 14-inch MacBook Pro, and maybe that will come in the future, but this isn't it. The screen itself is still really good, same as last year. In fact, it's actually the second best 13-inch screen that I've personally measured. And emphasis on that, because even though Apple claims 500 nits, that's not what my colorimeter measured. And if you're wondering, the top spot goes to the 2020 Spectre X360. The only areas I would say this isn't class leading in is probably brightness and contrast. It's still really good, like I don't want to make it seem worse than it is, but I'm just saying that it's not quite class leading. I've measured like two laptops before, the Spectre X360 and the XPS 15 9570 that have exceeded this in both brightness and contrast, but were not as color accurate and didn't have as good of an anti-reflective coating. The thermals on this are really strange because for some reason, the higher end model has weaker cooling than the base model, and I'll show the numbers in a bit. But first, the 13 inch MacBook Pro with two Thunderbolt 3 ports is configured with a 15 watt CPU, whereas this one, the one with four Thunderbolt 3 ports, is configured with a faster 28 watt CPU, which means this thing has to dissipate significantly more power, and if you look at the thermals, the lower end 13 inch reaches 87 degrees while boosting to 28 watts, whereas this higher end model reaches 100 degrees while boosting to just 31 watts, which again is really strange. But the takeaway is that the higher spec CPU cannot maintain full boost clock. They're both given essentially the same amount of power. And if you push the CPU to 100% for an extended period of time, the higher end model will actually throttle well below base clock, meaning the lower end would actually perform better. It does take around five minutes for it to actually drop below base clock, just keep that in mind. And if you look at the graph on screen, the 16 inch was able to dissipate 15 more watts of power compared to the previous 2019 and 15 inch model. Now, the thing with the 13 inch MacBook Pro is that it's built for portability, right? The 15 inch was made for performance at the sacrifice of portability, but the 13 inch was not. However, you can keep the 13 inch MacBook Pro for portability, better performance, better screen, and an all around better laptop compared to the MacBook Air, but introduce a 14 inch MacBook Pro that's noticeably faster and better all around than the 13 inch MacBook Pro. So you'd have the option to pick between performance and portability, and it would let you take better advantage of the higher end CPU by improving the thermals. So here are my conclusions. The 13 inch MacBook Pro with four Thunderbolt 3 ports might have better speakers, double the Thunderbolt 3 ports. It can be configured with double the maximum RAM and storage to 32 gigs and two terabytes and faster integrated graphics. But because the screen, the keyboard, the CPU performance and better life are all the same, I mean, you're gonna be pulling nine hours of better life. I'm gonna steer you towards the cheaper end model running the eighth gen CPUs. It does kind of suck that there's this feeling of not having the latest and greatest just because it's like, it's the eighth generation CPUs, not the 10th generation, even if it doesn't amount to anything tangible, but they are, for all intents and purposes, identical. Okay, that is the end of this video. I'm curious to know what you guys think, particularly any information I might've missed regarding the lower end versus the higher end model. But I hope you enjoyed this video and I'll see you guys next time.